Good evening and welcome to One Work, Five Questions with Donna Vitek and Dr. Mark Andrew Holachak. Thank you for joining us. Good evening, all. Good. Um, yes, we're, we're kind of off schedule this week a little bit. So, um, so we're bringing you Thomas Jefferson's letter to Meriwether Lewis, dated the 20th of June, 1803. Hmm. What are we going to learn about this today, Dr. Holacek? <laughs> well, uh, well, we'll find out, won't we? Yes, we will. Um, okay, so let me get pull up my stuff here because I'm I'm high tech now. I'm not printing everything, but now I need to find it. <laughs> You're way ahead of me, my dear. <laughs> I'm playing I hate around with cameras and software, and I know nothing about this sort of stuff, and it drives me nuts. So, just take. I, I prefer to print. I don't know. Anyway. Okay. So, oh no, I lost it. Okay. Um, so everyone is familiar to some extent with the Lewis and Clark expedition, which was at the behest of President Thomas Jefferson. Today, we look at a lengthy letter from Thomas Jefferson to Captain Meriwether Lewis, the head of that expedition. And very I, lengthy letter. A very lengthy. Oh, I, I, We're not going to go into all of it, but uh, we'll get at the gist. Oh, okay. Because, yeah, I've read some longer ones by Mr. Jefferson. Um, like, oh, he's long-winded. Um, he can be. Yes. Uh, so I am... The, oh, go ahead. ahead. What? I was going to say, that was often a tendency at the time, to be a little bit verbose. We, long sentences and long explanations. We don't do that. I, uh, I think one of his sentences in one of the letters at the beginning when we first started doing the program was like four or five lines long. And I'm like, this is a run-on sentence. <laughs> Well, back then it wouldn't have been considered. But anyways, I mean, I don't think they had texting back then. Oh. He wasn't good at that. And if they did, I don't think he was good at it. So, <laughs> so much for that. Oh, well, first, before we get started, before you start answering questions, I want to let everyone know that you are qualified to do so. Oh, you're um, going to have to do the credentials thing. Oh, gotcha. I, ha I must. I must. Because gotcha. that's very important to me when I'm doing research and um, I want to know what qualifies this person to make these statements or. Uh, well, make well, you can see four of my five diplomas back there. I don't get too close because yeah, I don't want you to read them because it might say it's, something other than what you think. It says certificate of attendance. That's it. <laughs> I was good. One was just by, you know, taking Jeffy into dog school and stuff like that. He got a certificate. Oh, yeah, I, I think that's says... close to those things. It says Jeffy on there. I don't see where it says <laughs> nothing. My name's not on any of them, but and that's why you have them so far back, right? <laughs> Absolutely. That's why I, I need to hang, my, no I need to hang my master's degree up here on my bookcase. Uh, with, next to those real books. I got gotcha. you. All right, let's get going here. Okay. Well, I am Dr. a well credentialed person. I, we got that. Okay, <laughs> yeah, that's it, period. Uh, Dr. Holacek has his PhD. He's a retired professor of philosophy and history. What a great combination. I know I've said that before, and I just love that combination. Um, he's taught at institutions such as University of Pittsburgh, University of Michigan, Rutgers University, Camden, Ohio University. Um, he's the editor of... The Journal of Thomas Jefferson and His Time, and he has written, uh, oh, what, 23 books now? Is it 23 books 23, on Thomas Jefferson? And at the end of today, maybe next time, maybe I might start at 24th. I have two others that aren't published yet, plus a third on which I'm working. And then wow. um, at the end, I might even start something on another topic, but that, neither here nor there for now. Oh, well, you know what? We'll have to do a one more five questions on you on all of your new projects and things you're doing. Well, yes. we'll see. Yes, to promote Thomas your... Jefferson is a little more interesting. Oh, no, we want to promote your new work. You're alive and with us. We want to learn more about you. Um, and you have close to 155 essays on Thomas Jefferson. If you please, please take the time to read. He's a phenomenal writer. Um, I, I, I don't keep know hoping. how many I have. I don't count them anymore. I just don't. It's sort of... I keep hoping the more I read your work, the more I'll start writing like you. And I, I have improved you a lot. You just need to write like you. That's all you need to worry about. Just matter. Just do it with uh, ingenuousness, sincerity, honesty, yeah. clarity, and uh, do it for the right reasons that you want yeah. to teach people uh, about women in the West or Thomas or whatever it is. You want to help expand their minds yeah. and how things were back then. 
<laughs> yeah, well, okay. I'll keep that in mind. Um, so everything, you'll be able to click on links in the um, description of the video to get to his articles and you'll see a list of his books and the two newest books will be listed there. Um, with our show One Work, Five Questions, I'll ask Dr. Holacek five questions on one work of Thomas Jefferson's. So today we're learning more about the Lewis and Clark expedition and what, Tom, what Thomas Jefferson wanted and expected from um, Captain Meriwether Lewis. Um, okay, so question number one, uh, what was the express purpose of the expedition? That I can answer succinctly, glycologously. He uh, says early on, the object of your mission is to explore the Missouri River in such principal stream of it as by its course and communication with water of the Pacific Ocean may offer the most direct and practicable water communication across this continent for the purposes of commerce. So he wants, uh, following your map there, he wants people to be able, he wants uh, Lewis, uh, Captain Lewis and Clark uh, to be able to travel to Missouri and see if we can't find a waterway to the Pacific Ocean. So that's I'm just going to leave it at that. that. And I love the black letter font on the bottom there. It's just a little bit zany and kind of fun. Yeah. But that's his express purpose. Okay. Fair enough. That Fair enough. I, I like this. Yeah, I didn't realize the Mississippi River um, and the uh, Missouri River. That I, the well, they, route. Hook up, they hook up like that. Yeah. That Interesting. Movie? It's amazing how much information they gathered with such little technology. <laughs> they well, didn't have all of You have to understand how important waterways back then, they still are today, but people don't. I mean, when you read history, don't understand. You had to have a city on a water, a large body of water, so you can get fresh water, so you could travel, safer means of communication or of travel sometimes being on the river than being in the forests. Uh, where Native Americans, you know, could could uh, accost you and things like that, but clearly, water was clean. Water was needed for you know for travel and drinking. Hmm. Notice all the big cities built on water. Yeah, interesting. Wow, how organized it really was. It's not random. Um, question number two. Okay, knowing what I know of Jefferson, there were many ancillary aims. What are they? Yeah, um, let's see, if I'm turn the page here. He says, um, look at the extent in the limits he's talking about. No, oh, that's the wrong passage here. Uh, what am I looking at? Oh, okay, objects. He says, other objects worthy of notice will be. He, he goes into, and I know you have a question for me for Native Americans, and that's going to be a long answer if I... But he says, other objects worthy of notice will be the soil and face of the country, its growth in vegetable productions, especially those not of the U.S. So when you get past the United States territory, tell us what kind of soil there is. So you know, we want to see about arable land. Um, the animals of the country generally, and especially those not known in the U.S. Here's Jeff again. Say hello, Jeff. Hi, Jeffy. Getting cigar smoke, Jeff. The remains and accounts of any which may be deemed rare or extinct. Again, he's talking to, yeah, is he talking about animals and plants? Maybe both. He doesn't quite tell us. The mineral productions are very kind, but more peculiarly, metals, limestone, pit coal, and saltpeter, salines, and mineral waters, noting the temperature. Mineral waters thought to be good for, for health. They had a lot of uh, um, places where you could go to soak in mineral waters and Jefferson went to one for his bad wrist and got bad diarrhea. Um, okay, noting the temperature of the last in such circumstances as may indicate their character, volcanic appearances. And he says, climate as characterized by the thermometer. Jefferson, as you know, and we all know, was taking meteorological temperatures and recording all sorts of weather and meteorological phenomena for 50 years, starting in 1776, when he was at the Continental Congress till the end of his life. Um, talking about the rainy, cloudy, and clear days by lightning. We'll talk of this some other time. He actually had an algorithm where he would go out and check not only the temperature, he would also talk about um, what's going on 
you know, if it's icy, rainy, cloudy, and stuff like that. So, right, it says, so it says, hail, snow, ice, and the access of, we got some crazy camera work going on here, don't we? <laughs> I know. We'll oh, there's two of me. <laughs> okay, but, uh, you know, and he says, the dates at which particular plants put forth or lose their flowers or leaf times of appearance, particular times of birds, reptiles, or insects. Why is he talking about particular appearance when birds, reptiles, and insects appear? Because that's when spring is going to go or when they disappear and things like that. So we know different times for growing and things like that. So those are some of the, so he's, to add to that, Jefferson has in the back of his mind, and I've written on this in his political philosophy and the metaphysics of utopia, that these lands might be part of a great United States country, maybe even all of North America at some time. And he wants to know just sort what sort of resources here. So this whole thing about he's just trying to see if there's a waterway to the Pacific, that's true. But he's got all sorts of other things. In right. mind. He studies everything. He's you know, when he looks down at dirt, he doesn't see what you and I see. He, he's analyzing everything. He's looking for insects and what kind of things are growing. And uh, he's looking at the value of the land, what can be built on it, what we can grow on it and things like that. So got a lot of things going on here. Okay. Okay. Um, question number three, why did he choose Meriwether Lewis? Well, Lewis was known to him. He was a, a fellow... Um, citizen of Albemarle County. Uh, Lewis was much uh, younger than Thomas Jefferson, born in 1774. He was known to Thomas Jefferson. He was also secretary at the time. Oh. Now, you're thinking about sending someone on this sort of trip. Think about it. Whom do you want? Whom can you send? I mean, you're just not going to pick anybody. You need someone who's a bit of a scientist, someone who's rugged, someone who can deal with uh, adversity. So you've got to be a, an adventurer, an outdoorsman, a right. bit of a scientist, um, and all sorts of things. So it's not an easy, you know, find to see the type of person that you can select for such a thing. Uh, he knew Meriwether Lewis as his secretary, and he you know, champion Lewis as his man to go out, Captain Lewis to go out and and, and run the show here for him. So, uh, yeah, uh, I, I can quote here. He says of um, Lewis to Benjamin Smith Barton in 1803 uh, during his presidency when the right. expedition goes out, he says it was impossible to find a character who to a complete uh, who took complete science and botany, natural history, mineralogy, and astronomy, joined the firmness of constitution. We talked about that. He's a sturdy guy and character. Prudence, prudence is the ability to have wisdom about practical wisdom, habits adopted to the woods and a familiarity with the Indian matters and character requisite for this undertaking, all the latter qualifications Captain Lewis has. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, he's going to, that said that he has all these qualifications doesn't mean he doesn't need to learn a little bit more. So he is uh, sends him to Philly to study medicine under Benjamin Rush, uh, study a little bit more about astronomy with Andrew Ellicott. We talked about Andrew Ellicott when we talked about Benjamin Banneker uh -huh. uh, and Casper Wistar to study living things, animals and plants, biodia. Uh, in preservation of if he's going to take kill animals and send species back, how do we preserve them so they don't decay and plants as well. So right. there's that going on. So he's got the ideal guy and he's going to educate him even more just so he can do the things he wants him to do. Yeah. Yeah. He does sound like the perfect candidate for the position. Well, a very good one. Yeah. Um, question number four, what were some of the preparatory details of the trip? Um, and what do they and the rest of the letter tell us about Thomas Jefferson? What um, preparatory details? I think he talks of these early on. Yeah. Well, he says instruments for ascertaining by celestial observations and so forth. Light articles for barter, presence among the Indians, arms for your attendance, 
uh, boats, tents, traveling apparatus, ammunition, medicine, surgical instruments, provision you will have prepared. He's even going to take um, medicine for plague for the Native Americans who are interested in being inoculated, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so, I mean, all sorts of things. I'm not going to bore you with all the details that he goes on because it might be a little bit cumbersome. But the idea is you've got this. I, I told you what he's asking him to do. We talk mineralogy, astronomy. So he has to have astronomical instruments, mineralogical instruments, botany. He's got to have a thermometer, a theolodite for you know measuring. So he's got to have all sorts of uh, instruments that are very, very well, and, I haven't. And, I, I and don't he, even he even talks about birch paper. Oh my god! On which to write, you write everything down. You write it on birch paper, so if it gets wet, it's still okay. And then you make copies of that and more copies. So, how many? What, how big was this entourage with all the stuff? Well, I don't know exactly how many, but there were quite a number. To to, uh, um. Yeah, so he talks about what, 10 to 12 men? I don't remember exactly how many people that were in the entourage. This is a good question. I'm sorry, I can't give you a more specific answer, but it's not so much that you're going to have this enormously large entourage, but you're mm -hmm. going to have people that are similar to uh, Meriwether Lewis that are very, notice how he spells Meriwether like Mary and then weather. Sorry. So he gets his name wrong. Someone's been working for him for a number of years and he can't spell a guy's name. <laughs> well, you know what I say about the smartest of people. <laughs> no, what do you say about the Oh, I can't say it right now. <laughs> There's a little bit of vulgarity there, I'm sure. No, 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 no. <laughs> Jeffy, cover your ears. He's making fun of you with you and your wisdom here. <laughs> Oh, question number five, Thomas Jefferson. So I ended up having to pull the questions up on my phone because I, I don't know how to get out of the Zoom, out of, out of the PowerPoint slide to get back. Well, to I've my got question. my old camera here that's sort of blinking in and out as we go along as you see people here. kind of, what the hell's going on? I'm trying to do more with software because I'm so far behind. I still have Windows 7 on my computer and I what, are, what are we up to now windows 25 what is it now i don't know 150 i i, I know there's at least windows 11 but oh 11 you, you talk about this is like from 2007 or so when i was still married and uh, <laughs> i was given this computer you, you know i i don't readily adapt to new technologies unfortunately yeah i need to because i can't do any uploading on my computer and stuff so everything's falling behind at some point my computer just might self-combust and burn you know maybe i'll it'd be a great finale for the show have the computer <laughs> burn oh my gosh so did you ask me a question or not what, what's oh no i didn't uh, question number five i can't get a word of it. <laughs> well that's good no um question all those books in the background that's what's going on <laughs> Uh, question number five. Thomas Jefferson says much in the letter about Native Americans. He had a distinct policy towards Native Americans. What was that policy? Ooh. Well, we go into a distinct policy. I don't know if I can answer that. Mm. I thought, and this will lead up to the teaser, we could talk in great detail next time about Jefferson and Native Americans. In one of my books, I have a whole chapter in Jefferson and the Native Americans. There is a yes, I used that in my paper. You did. Yes, a beautiful I did. correspondent. Yeah, um, but, uh, I can't remember which one. Yeah, I'll bring it up that the computer doesn't get. Here's my book, beautiful correspondent, and I have a chapter in Jefferson and Native Americans in it. Oh, okay, beautiful. And then there's this other book we'll talk about. Anthony Wallace, who writes this book on called Jefferson and the Indians. Uh -oh. And uh, we could talk about it next time, but it is a book that I had tried, I have had for many, many years, and I tried on several occasions to read it. I never get past the preface. Why? Because it is so anti-Thomas Jefferson. I mean, he just comes out and just talks. So Jefferson is Satan personified. Oh, brother. And he hated the Native. And well, this is not true. He, he, he didn't hate Native Americans. He had right. some harsh things to say. We'll talk about that next time. Okay. But um, I hope to show that he had a profound uh, love and appreciation for Native Americans, he, which right. turned hostile at times during his presidency uh, because they weren't really 
all that eager to miscegenate and integrate into the United States government or be part of the new country. And uh, it's all understandable. They have their own yeah. way of life and they have a, a right to, but you know, we can talk about that next time. But he says, uh, when you go, he says, uh, with the people inhabiting, you'll pursue, I want to, you to learn as much as you can about uh, the names of their nations and their numbers, the extent and limits of their possessions, their relations with other tribes or nations, their language, traditions, and monuments. Jefferson collective native, collected Native American dialects. I don't know if anybody knows that. And he had many of them. And they all got lost in transit, I think, on the James, where um, he was sending a bunch of his possessions on the James. And a couple thugs um, took the boat, and they opened up his trunk and everything. And they were looking. They were hoping for money or valuables. And they found, oh, wow. They found Native American languages on papers and just scattered and threw them all over. So, so Jefferson lost all that. Oh. Um, so their ordinary occupations in agriculture, fishing, hunting, war arts, and implements for these, their food, clothing, and domestic accommodations, the diseases prevalent among them and the remedies they use. So he's looking for possibilities for uh, drawing from the natives for natural uh, um, medicines for certain mm -hmm. diseases. Um, and uh, Jefferson probably was unaware too that by traveling like that, that, that they were spreading the possibility of diseases that, right, right, that white right. people to which white people are exposed. And, and again, natives who are exposed to certain diseases that they might have had, he's exposing uh, you know, his uh, entourage, Lewis's entourage. He says the moral and physical circumstance which distinguish them from the tribes they know so how are they physically different, taller, shorter, or have different customs? Peculiar, peculiarities in their laws, customs, and dispositions, and articles of commerce they may need to furnish and to what extent. He says it will be useful to acquire what knowledge you can of the state of morality, religion, and information among them may better enable those who endeavor to civilize and instruct them to adapt their measures to the existing notions and practices of those on whom they are to operate. So this whole notion of uh, understanding or uh, uh, working on the assumption that the natives are in a barbaric stage right. of civilization, and that was assumed by all the scientists of the time that there were at least some acknowledged there were four called stadialism there were four stages and jefferson will we'll see he talks in one of his letters he says you can see these stages just from traveling from the west all the way to the east coast mm -hmm. right you see native americans in a state of barbarism now this doesn't mean they can't be civilized and i don't want to broach this whole thing that uh, this is just a bunch of white man lingo talking about you know, it was just assumed by the educated people of the time that that um, there was a natural progression of human beings from barbaric states and that all people would, mm -hmm. Native American, Blacks or whatever, um, would, would follow the state of progression in time. And of course, if you can have exposure to to other civilized um, of, of peoples, uh, you would you would hasten this. Now, some people thought that this four-stage process, the last stage was the stage of decay. Mm -hmm. Plato says that early, that he, uh, not necessarily talking about four stages, but talking about how the last stage, because all things in the visible world are ephemeral. So even the greatest political um, uh, units will have a, a natural stage of decay, Plato talks about, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's when they get to the stage of tyranny. So people following Plato's sentiments there will talk about, look at the Gibbons, the rise and fall of the Roman Empire. So we have this natural assumption that, that all things will, if, just like a human being or an animal, there's a state of, uh, of nascency, a state of maturation, a state of, of full maturation, a state of, of senescence, you know, where you start getting older and decay and, and that's that. So there, most people, now, not all people bought that, that there had to be decay. Some people thought that very rarely, but they thought that there could be a sort of convergence towards Condorcet, for example, the Frenchman. There, there could be, I don't know why my brain's a little sharp today at this time. It was about 
10 o'clock at night right now? No. But I mean, there, you know, some people thought that there could be ideally a convergence towards uh, perfection. Uh -huh. And perfection didn't mean, you know, uh, we're talking about utopia, we meant the sort of moral perfection where there's no more war and people lived in a, and I think Jefferson bought into this to some extent. Most of us were farmers. We uh -huh. weren't worried about the big cities. We stayed away from big city development. We farmed goods. We had abundancy of goods and people uh, in, in this ideal state didn't go to war. And uh, this is the sort of utopism about which we talked last time that Jefferson got um, from, from Moore in his utopia. I said Bacon last time. I made that corrigé in French. I had the yeah. Bacon didn't write that. Moore did. Uh, Condorcet, Mercier, and many other. James Harrington talked about you know improvement, and so forth. So Lord Kane. So this was just in the air. Uh, enlightenment times because you know we're mute, uh, emerging from the uh, centuries of feudalism mm -hmm. to a more enlightened thing and this was a very exciting optimistic time for people mm -hmm. so i see we've changed something on the screen there oh so, that, that's about all i'm going to say about the native americans there's a lot more to say he says much much more uh, i don't want to bore readers either, but i mean he's sensitive to the people's there. And he does invite, he says, if you can see any of the chiefs, if, they, if anybody wants to be inoculated against smallpox, we'll do that. And any of the chiefs want to come to Washington. And when he's president, he does have several conferences with some of the Native oh. American chiefs. And he, oh, wow. will, he will invite, as we'll see next time, mm -hmm. uh, Native Americans to participate, right? And we'll explain why in, in, in miscegenate, intermarry with the white people. Wow. Inform one people. Uh, not all of his plans were were rosy, mm -hmm. perfectly motivated, but he had that plan, that Native Americans. He had a high respect for Native Americans. He really did. From his childhood, from exposure to them, from his father. Mm -hmm. And the Natives frustrated him while he was president because they weren't all that excited about getting involved. Right. Well, Quitting, you know, you're asking, you want to quit your way of life and become part of this? Well, you know, we're sort of nomadic people. We live off the land, we hunt and gather, and you're asking us, do we want to quit all that, start something new? Right. Some, some found it interesting, others didn't. So we can understand that. And uh, it's funny because in my world history course, I'm um, uh, discussing that with my student. Uh, we did that last week. Um, our hunter gatherers act, were they actually better off than we are today? Because uh, it was estimated that they only spent, I think it was uh, averaged at 15 hours a week hunter, hunting and gathering and about 15 to 20 hours a week doing chores. So they only spent 30 hours a week um, getting their food and cleaning and, and doing their, their and chores. Their life, and their life expectancy was what? I don't know. Very much reduced from, you know, I, I'm not answering the question one way. But um, yeah, so uh, I mean, so one way to answer the question, this is a, an answer Plato gives, and he doesn't give it to that question, but he gives it to a different question. Plato's asking the question John Stuart Mill asked that is the life of the laborer uh, or the life of the virtuous person or the life of the uh, politician, which is the better lifestyle? And he said, well, the laborer is going to say the laborer, the, you know, the politician, the politician, the, right. the one who's the virtuous person, he says, but Clearly, you asked one who's lived all three. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah. Pretty most, for the most part, he's saying, well, the virtuous person has has done all and lives the way he does, you know, whether you like that answer or not. But, but, but John Stuart Mill, many decades, not decades, but centuries later, will say the same thing. The way to answer that question, it's like answering a question, do women in Islamic countries have a better life than women, say, in Western countries? Right. Well, if you ask a woman in an Islamic society, she's going to say, oh, I've had a better life here. And a Western woman will. But if you ask a woman who's lived in both, that's the sensible person to ask, is it not? Ask well, people who've lived right. both. Well, you have to have experience of both. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you had someone who lived in both, someone who lived in the West and went to an Islamic country and adopted those habits, and you can get a consensus of opinion from people who had 
If it's split, then we don't have an answer. But if we have a strong consensus on that, then we probably have a pretty, empirically speaking, we have a pretty good answer. Yeah. You don't entirely <laughs> like that, huh? <laughs> I like that answer. I think Plato was right. <laughs> So tell us, give us a teaser. What's coming up next week? Or actually not even a week. It'll be Sunday. Yeah, it's, it's, the time flies. Huh? Tempest, as the, as the Romans said, tempus fugit. It doesn't mean what you think it means. It doesn't mean fuck time. It means time flies. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I thought we'd look, you know, I, th I think, you know, the follow-up, one of the things I like to do in these things is to, when we find a nugget, about which we've talked about here, and if we could follow that up in Native Americans. Do you think that would be okay. kind of cool to talk about Jefferson's views? We talked about Jefferson's views on African Americans. Uh, what about Native Americans? Did he okay. think that they were inferior? He certainly saw, uh, saw them as in a state of barbarism. Right. Now, did he think that that was an incurable thing? Did he and again, I'm not talking, we're not going to be talking about barbarism versus Western civilization because one is definitely better than the other. I'm not trying to do any of that. Try and understand how he thought. Mm -hmm. What do you think of Native Americans? Did he, as many people, did, did he, uh, as Wallace said, did he just hate them? I mean, he just, you know, he's, he talks about Jefferson as being someone who had an incurable lust for power. Yeah. To me, I, I find some of these claims to be rather silly. Yeah. Um, that, well, that's obviously somebody who doesn't, who hasn't studied Jefferson very well. Uh, not much. I mean, you write one book on him and you think, you know, uh, you, you think you've, you've figured him out. He's so easy to figure yeah. out. And I, I found, by the way, so, I mean, we could talk about in his notes on Virginia query, I think 11 and he does okay. query 14 as well. We'll talk from his notes on Virginia, what Jefferson thought about Native Americans, and there's a lot to unpack there. It's really so. I, I said I might write a book on that before I retire from this. Okay. I'm doing Ukrainian studies right now. I'm doing Stalin, uh, Stalinist Ukraine, Stalin's Ukrainian policy from 1928 to 1933, uh, and I did finish the draft of that book. There's a lot more to do on that, but I might, as a corrective to this book, because it's just so bad, and to think that that's the only thing out there that people will read. You know, you walk away thinking this guy was really a bastard. Yeah. Let's just crucify Thomas Jefferson. And I hate people who, who write like that, who have an agenda, who, who come in and, you know, like I said, I've never gotten through the intro, just through the introduction. I, it's just, it's so egregiously hateful. Oh. Not given, Jefferson's not given a fair trial. Um, I, I, so that's what we'll do next time. We have, okay. I, I am reading, I don't know if you can see this. No, it's Gordon, Gordon Woods' uh, revolutionary oh. characters, and it was kind of funny. Um, and I like Gordon Wood. He's one of the best uh, American study scholars in the world. Oh, wow. And just about everything he writes, I like. I, I just read his first chapter in Washington. I thought it was horrible. He calls Jefferson, he calls Washington. I must want to write something just on that chapter. He says he was a great man, Washington, which may or may not be true, and the greatest president. Huh. Those are very strong. The second is a very strong claim, and he doesn't unpack, unpack that second claim until very late in his paper. But uh, everything he says about Washington's greatness is because he's a, a morality-abiding person, but the sort of morality that Gordon Wood unpacks is the uh, you, you get Washington as this thin-skinned, sensitive person, sensitive to his reputation. Everything wow. he does, he does the right thing, but he always does it because he's worried about what people, what history books will say about him. Mm -hmm. and, and that's not the sort of morality that we get from the ancients. That you know, Jefferson was thin-skinned, as I said last time we saw in the last letter. But <clears throat> for him, the morality that drove him was. Seneca, the Stoics, mm -hmm. Aristotle, Plato was that virtue ethics. Jefferson was a moral sense theorist, but basically drew much, much sustenance from these ancients. And for ancients, morality, you're not a morally good person because you do the right thing, because you're worried about what people, what history books will write about you. 
mm -hmm. do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. Right. You're you're, if you're innovate. You're motivated by an inter inner source. Intrinsic. Intrinsic quality. motivation. That's the word. Yeah. I'm looking for, that those big words you use. Um, yeah, you have an intrinsic motivation. <laughs> and the idea is your thoughts. And, and, and Wood talks about how when, when Washington was making important decisions, he consulted people and people gave him uh, all sorts of information just in terms of how people would see your decision if you do this or that. And that, in most cases, was the deciding factor. That's not very interesting to me to make someone a morally good person. Right. Certainly not the, the 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 recipe that Jefferson followed. Uh, uh, Jefferson clearly was thin skinned and he worried what the history books would say. But as I said last time, ultimately he settled on, look, I am my best judge by reading the right sorts of things, thinking by following, we talk about following the precepts of Jesus. Uh -huh. When we follow Jesus as a, a, moral, uh, a morality inspirer, Right. We're not worried about what the history books will say to me. Look what happened to Christ. He was crucified. Right. Uh -huh. he certainly wasn't all that worried about what people were going to say about him. Right. I was very, very disappointed with Gordon Wood's initial chapter. Hopefully it picks up a little bit. I just have to throw that out because it's I'm thinking. Gordon, no, <laughs> this is beneath you to have. I, I, but I would say. I think this is where he's hampered by lack of knowledge of Aristotle and Plato and the Stoics and what Je how Jefferson really read and assimilated this material. And I think that's, gets, that's what makes you so great as a historian is your experience with philosophy, your knowledge of philosophy combined with history, that you can translate things. Well, thank you. But you have to have that, Donna, because Jefferson read all this. And he not only read it, he reread it and reread it. When he right. talked about Tavine Utley, how he never went to bed without at least a half hours of reading upon which I could ruminate in the hours of sleep. Mm -hmm. You know, and we talked about that. The funny thing is he's talking about not just thinking about before I go to bed, right. but when I wake up. If I right. have to wake up to, to go potty, as some uh -huh. people call it. If I have to go to the bathroom, if I have to go to the little pot underneath my bed or yeah. you know, something in the house, uh, I want to be able to think about something inspiring. Right. How cool is that? Yeah. How cool is that? To me, that's what, you know, that's my assessment of morality. And I see we're running out of time. I'm going to give you the last words. I've been speaking way too much. I have a good cigar. <laughs> <laughs> I think I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> well, I mean, we're just talking about the Lewis and Clark. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. We're talking about the Lewis and Clark. Explanation. You got. You're off. You're you're out of uh, out of sync. <laughs> oh boy. Yes. But I can just say, look, he tired. <laughs> he saw the potential for growth, and he saw this as possibly part of the American Empire for Liberty. Yes. Yeah as other people said, and he said twice, empire of or empire for liberty,